Hey, this is Brent Jensen, and you're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. Listeners, welcome to the introductory episode of a special multi-episode series being recorded live here on location at the Steam Whistle Brewery facility in the historic John Street Roundhouse in downtown Toronto. Joining me here today in the Roundhouse to kick off this series is Steam Whistle Marketing VP and music fan, Tim McLaughlin. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate oh, it's, it. It's great to have you here, Brent. And thanks so much for, for obviously doing this here and, and uh, for having us on. It's an honor. I've always loved the product. I had my first steam whistle in, I want to say, summer 2001. And I had it at uh, Rodney's Oyster House. Oh, yeah. King West. Yeah. They've been a loyal customer for many years. Rodney's been a big supporter of ours. And yeah, obviously great, uh, great local institution. If you're looking for good seafood, that's the place to go. Yeah. So... Yeah, and I think uh, obviously history goes way back. I've been here about 17 years. Steam Whistle, we're in our, our 20th year this year. So obviously a rich history, obviously with the beer and, and becoming one of you know Canada's leading independent breweries. But also I think in a lot of ways, music's intertwined with, with the history of this company, both in terms of you know how we built the brand, supporting you know great music-based initiatives, both sort of at the grassroots level, all the way up to things like the Junos. And, and, and this building itself, we've hosted a number of, you know, really interesting events in relation to music. We had our own independent concert series, Steam Whistle Unsigned, for a number of years. And so I think you can't really talk about the beer without sort of bringing up the connection to, to arts and music. And that's the thing. So I've always loved the brand, but when I kind of dug into the heritage and, um, you know, Steam Whistle's affinity for music and the arts, it, it was a bigger draw for me. Yeah, and I think that, that sort of, you know, starts with our founders. You, you, you know the story of our three fired guys, Cam, Greg, and Greg, and there's sort of, you know, Steam Whistle was born out of the fact that they'd worked at, at Upper Canada and they were all fired. And, and, you know, when that happened, obviously they went off and did their own other, went off and did their own things separately, but really wanted to get back into the beer business and, and sort of it's when they came up with the idea of Steam Whistle. And so there's really an underdog spirit that lives through this, you know, this brand, this company that sort of, you know, I think has a lot of parallels to the music industry and musicians where they're, you know, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. At the best of times, right? Oh, Especially yeah. if you're sort of an independent artist trying to uh, trying to make it make ends meet. So I think you know we always saw the arts community as as a great opportunity to to number one support things that we believed in. But I think also, frankly, it was a community that was largely underserved by the beer industry for for so many years. As you know, the major brands supported things like sports and hockey, baseball, football. So it was a great opportunity to to support an area where we felt that was underserved. But also, frankly, there's so many great beer drinking occasions that tie into <laughs> music and the arts. And so, uh, you know, we always felt that we really built the brand through this, but creating, you know, memorable experiences with our beer, you know, in, in situations where people are engaged and, and passionate about is, is really what I think has helped us create, you know, long-term affinity for the brand and people that, you know, really believe in what we're doing and, and want to be a part of it. So, yeah, it's a tremendous story. You know, we were talking about it before you showed up in a fantastic facility here. Yeah, I mean, we call it, we call it the Cathedral of Beer, and yeah. so you know you can't tell the story of Steam Whistle without talking about this place. It's um, you know the Roundhouse was built in 1929, and it's a big part of the pioneering of this country. You know, Canadian Pacific Railways uh, maintained all of their steam locomotives here for you know right up until uh, the 80s. Obviously, diesel locomotives later on. Um, so it's, a, it's in some ways it's the story of Canada, but uh, you know the location of this place being right underneath the CN Tower, across the street from the Rogers Centre. It's really been a huge part of how people have experienced our beers and, and something that people, we put about a hundred and regular year, <laughs> not, not this year, obviously, we put about 120,000 people through the building a year on tours wow. and with events. So, you know, it's a, it's been a you know real sustainable brand touch point for us where people, you know, can come in here, learn about our products, smell the beer being made in the brew house. And so, you know, we've, we've really focused on making it not only a brewery, but also sort of an experience center where people can come in and engage with our brand and, and be part of the Sea Missile brand. Yeah, you know, you, you call it the Cathedral of Beer. This is certainly a place of worship if you're into beer and music, that's for sure. Very impressive, and, and I'm very happy to be here. So thanks. Well, wow, it's again. great to have you. It's nice to uh, be able to do something that's appropriate during the, you know, the COVID era. Obviously, we'd love to be, you know, in a spot where, you know, we can host events safely, you know, and we hope that that time is not too far in the distant future. But given where we are, it's nice to be able to uh, to use the space for something that's going to connect with people uh, in a way that uh, is appropriate for, you know, the situation we're dealing with, right? Absolutely. So, Tim, in addition to being the marketing VP here at Steam Whistle, you are also a music fan. 
So in keeping with the show's theme, you have provided me with five songs <laughs> that make your skin vibrate. It's a diverse list. I know. Yeah, that. it sort of went all across the board there. Yeah, I think uh, and that, that's sort of my musical taste. Obviously, they always evolve with, with time. And I think, you know, it's a tough, tough question to ask yourself. You know, mm-hmm. there was two there that came to right to the top of the list. And then you, you got to choose five. I mean, in some ways, it's tough to narrow it down to five. And in some ways, you know, if it, it's sort of a reflection of your musical taste, you know, it's kind of a different, difficult thing to put on paper in some ways. The biggest complaint I get on the show is that I, I only allow five. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's difficult, Yeah, you know, to just have five. So um, let's, let's have a look at your list here. So you start your list of five off with the Tragically Hip looking for a place to happen. Yeah, so I think uh, the Hip is one of those bands, I think, you know, as a Canadian that obviously a lot of people have such a strong connection to. And for me, it, it's a connection that really lasts my almost my entire life. I think they were the band that got me into to rock music. I think prior to that, I'd been listening to crappy dance music. I think put it lightly. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Dance Mix '95 because I'll still put it on every now and then. It was a good CD, but um, you know, Road Apples was probably the first rock CD I owned, and oh, really? there was yeah. a bunch of uh, great songs on obviously on that, uh, like Twist My Arm and and uh, Little Bones. But I think had the the chance to see them at another roadside attraction mm. in 1997 at uh, Molson Park, Park in yeah. Barrie. Yeah. And I can't remember if they closed with looking for a place to happen, but it was just like a mind blowing experience. Number one, seeing them, seeing them for the first time. And I think, you know, what's so striking about the hip and what I've really come to appreciate about them is just how proficient they were their whole career. Yeah. Like you can go back and I think a lot of, hip fans you sort of pick up where you started listening to them but there's some great video online of them in you know germany in 1993 and just how engaging gord always was how tight they were as a band so that song i think is the one that i've sort of loved the entire way through and i think got such a big catalog that you can sort of go through oh yeah you know times where you're listening to in violet light or or some of the other obviously albums that I probably didn't appreciate as much at the time when they came out as I should have. Mm. Um, but I would say that's probably the one song that, uh, that has stuck with me the longest and had the chance to, uh, you know, to see them, I think on six or seven occasions live. So probably seen them more than any other band, saw them in blues fest in Ottawa and, and had the chance to, uh, to see them at their last show here in Toronto at what was then the ACC now oh, Scotiabank, right. which was awesome. And I think, it was obviously a magical night and one that you'll oh, never yeah. forget. They didn't play that song, so that was the one that you're hoping for. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Obviously, they played a lot of my other favorite hits. Yeah. Um, but if I had to choose one song, it would be that one, I think. Great. Yeah, tremendous band. Tremendous band. Yeah. Uh, the Roots is next. Step Into the Realm. This is a very interesting pick. 1999, I think this came out. Yeah, I mean, another band that's got a really deep catalog. And I think, you know... A band that uh, I think really kind of got me into hip hop because obviously they're very much a live band in some ways, but um, they also sound great on an album, right? If you mm-hmm. listen to one of their studio albums, but you know, playing instruments and uh, and again, I think a situation where you know they've got such a engaging and prolific frontman, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I've seen them a couple times as well. I think. Um, I had the opportunity, I, I did an exchange when I was in university to Stockholm, Sweden, Oh, and um, had the chance to see them. They were playing a, a, this venue, which is called Barons. It's a hotel that is 100 years old, it's beautiful, stunning. gold-plated ballroom. Wow. It only had about 250 people in it, and they unfortunately had to cancel because I think somebody in the band was sick. Mm. But as a result, on the makeup date, they ended up playing like four hours. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, they opened with Step Into the Realm. And I think, you know, if you ever listen to The Roots Come Alive, which is their live album, which I think they recorded around the similar time frame. That would have been 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you hear it uh, on the album, maybe not as, uh, as impactful, but you hear them play it live. It's a totally different experience with the, the full band and just such an interesting song. So I think, again, I think it's an example of, of a song that obviously means a lot to me, but also I think more speaks to if you have to choose one of your favorite bands, what's the one song from that band that you would choose, right? right, right. A lot of people probably choose, I don't know, one of their, their major hits. That's probably not one of them. But that to me is, I think, the one that, uh, you know, you keep going back to. It's funny. I got into them through their, uh, the record they did with Elvis Costello, Wise Up Ghost. I don't know if really? you know that. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, I'd read somewhere that on this song, it's funny you mentioned this, Stepping in the Realm, they did something called pause tape looping. Do you know what that is? No. So this is really interesting. So Questlove, before the band got famous, worked as a, an insurance salesman. And he was try- <laughs> yeah, right. And he was trying to make money to finance the demos for the band. Yeah. And uh, so what he would do, he, he said, you know, at the time I was going nuts and it was either take drugs or, you know, kind of clear my mind. So what I would do is I would use this really old school and this is before like, you know, technology and tracking or, or you know, sophisticated equipment that he could afford. He would use a boom box and he would record drum breaks from his favorite songs that he liked. So what the pause tape looping involves is putting your thumb on the record button and then putting your finger on the pause button. Huh. And when the drum loop or when the drum break comes in, you take your pause finger off, you record it on one. So it goes one, two, three, four. And when it starts again, you take it off. Interesting. And then you do it again. So you create this kind of like drum loop, do it yourself loop. Yeah, that's right? cool. So he said he would lay in bed at night and create like 45 minutes of these loops. And that's how he kind of calmed his mind to get through this period of like selling insurance to get the roots on their feet. Wow. It's a cool story. Super yeah. cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and obviously it's been great to see them have so much success. And obviously they're on t- tonight's show now. Can't think of a better house band to have than them. And they do so much cool stuff with them in, in some of the content they produce. Yeah. In some ways it's a, it's a shame because it kind of takes them off the road. Uh, I mean, I think they were road warriors, right? They'd be on the road 200 dates a year oh, yeah. a lot of times, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but good to see them, uh, them being successful is obviously a great thing. I love when uh, artists come in and sit in with them. Yeah. I saw Lester Holt from Dateline actually right. sit in. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. Lester Holt. Who playing, would have known? Yeah. Playing the bass. Yeah. Like who would have known? And yeah. he's upstairs, I guess, doing Dateline. So he came downstairs and sat in with the band. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. That is super cool. I didn't see that. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, next, I love this pick. The Who, Eminence Front. Yes, that's uh, another one where I think if you're a big Who fan, there's probably people that hate that era, right? Yeah. Oh, it's hard. What was it, 82? Yeah, right? it was like 82. So it's sort of yeah. like past sort of their initial success. And uh, obviously it's a song that Roger doesn't really feature prominently on from a vocal standpoint, right? He hates this whole record except for this tune, apparently. Roger yeah. Daltrey, yeah. But just, uh, you know, the keys that open it up, you're like what's happening. And then such a great bass line in it. It sort of just pulses through the entire track. And then it's sort of like that tale of 80s excess. So, it, you know, in some ways it feels right out of 1982. Yeah. But in a lot of ways it feels like it could have been written yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it just seems like it's sort of got that timeless uh, feel. It doesn't, you know, it's obviously a rock song. I wouldn't call it, it doesn't sound like a classic rock song necessarily though, right? No. Um, yeah, it's just such a great track the whole way through. And, and I think so different than all the other stuff that they've they've ever done. So... Um, that's one that, you know, is always in my heavy rotation yeah. all the time. You're having a few drinks or you're just chilling out at home. It's, uh, it suits a lot of occasions and I think, yeah, just such a, a timeless track. Oh yeah. 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 I love it. I love yeah. it. Uh, synth pop now, future islands and balance. Yeah, that was, I mean, I love future islands. I think if anyone's seen Samuel T. Herring, their front man, Hard to, hard to picture somebody who could possibly have any more energy on stage. Guy dances around like a wild man. It's mm. crazy to actually see him <laughs> perform live. And, and some of these bands that I've, I've gotten into more recently, because it's kind of interesting how you, you kind of pick up music now. And I think, you know, obviously when I was a kid, it was, it was all about radio. That's where you'd, you'd hear new music, whether yeah. that was here in the city on, on 102.1 or, you know, or other stations. And then I think later on it was really illegal downloads and people sharing music online, right? And sorry if anybody from the music business is hearing it, but that's, that's how music was. <laughs> when I was in university, that's how you'd get find new music. You know, somebody would download something or send you, you know, MP3 yeah. and you'd pick it up. And then now it's kind of weird. I think that obviously there's Shazam now. So you hear a song and you'll, you know, what, what is that song? You'll try and figure out what it is, whether that's, you know, out at a restaurant or out at a bar or, or somewhere else. And then that journey for me is now normally if there's a song I really like, I'll end up watching it in, on YouTube before I go to bed. Yeah. And so that's sort of how I came upon Future Islands. Uh, I heard the song actually in the retail store here at Steam. Oh. I go, who is that? Like, what is this band? Because it's, it's a really cool song. And then, you know, just went in this deep dive, as, as you can on YouTube, like this deep mm-hmm. hole in terms of who is this guy, number one, because yeah. he's such a crazy performer, I think is the best way to put it. Um, and just started going deep on them. There's, you know, such a unique band, I think, in a lot of ways. And so much sound coming out of three guys. Mm. Um, so Balance is, uh, is, is my favorite song from them. They've got other ones that are great, like Seasons. 
but you know, if I, I, I encourage you to go, if you haven't heard of them, go on YouTube and, and check them out because super unique and, and, you know, just crazy energy coming out of this, this tiny little guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine got me onto them a long, back in, I want to say like the late two thousands, if that's right, I could be right. wrong about that, but he used to give me these, um, CDs, mix CDs. Yeah. And this was one of the, this balance was not on, but Future Islands was, was yeah. on the, on the CD and cool tune. Yeah, it seems like they sort of came up through like the the college circuit, like playing college towns, playing college bars, and it's sort of just it's been a slow burn. Like they're still not like maybe a household name, but I think have you know they reached a point where they're playing Massey Hall here in Toronto, which oh. they, they mentioned like big deal for them, right? And they went from playing you know tiny little venues to oh, yeah. uh, working their way up, doing it on the road, yeah, sort of the classic uh, classic way. So yeah, yeah. You know, getting back to Shazam, like whoever invented Shazam should be knighted in my For sure. Opinion. You mean imagine that? Like and it's not not even just that you can tell what every song is, you know, like you can usually figure out what that song is that you know, what is that? You can actually figure out what song it is, but it's also like remembering that song that you heard that you like because you right. can go back three days there. Oh, I forgot I liked it, you know. That's right. So it's not even just figuring out which song it is, it's also remembering that song that you like that you didn't know what it was. So yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. It's uh it's going to be hard to picture life before it in some ways, but uh, I don't know how you'd figure out what, what was what back in the day, right? You'd have to ask somebody. Or My recollection, I used to listen to the radio, and sometimes they wouldn't say what the song was. It drove me nuts, it, too. It yeah. just like, would infuriate me. And so you just hoped that it would play again, and, right. you, and you caught it. Right. And then you know, when videos came out, obviously, it, it, you could see it. But yeah, it yeah. was just like luck. You know? <laughs> yeah. it was, I, yeah, that's one of the problems with music now is, you know, Obviously, when you had a catalog of CDs or cassettes or, or whatever, I started with cassettes and then moved to CDs. But there was, I don't know, there's so much music available at, at the tip of your fingers now that oh, like yeah. sometimes I have trouble remembering what I like in yeah. some ways, right? Yeah. Um, so obviously, it's it's amazing to have literally almost every song performed or recorded at your fingertips. At your fingertips. But the amount of times that I sit there now going like, what do I want to listen to? And you don't know where to start, right? I mean, obviously, there's great curated playlists on Spotify and things like that. But, you know, in some ways, it was easier when you go, I'm going to pop this CD in and listen to it the whole way through. I mean, how often do you do that now? I mean, yeah. if there's a band you really like, you'll probably listen to the whole album. But used to be invest 15, 20 bucks into it, like, probably going to listen to the whole thing. Whereas now, you know, it's probably yeah. happening a lot less often. You know, it's, it's funny you make that comment because I, I have, and I still have them, a bunch of CDs, like hundreds and hundreds, right? And so before I would walk up to my collection and say, what do I want to listen to? Is it going to be, you know, this or this or this? But I find that with, and I love it. I love Spotify. I love having all those mm -hmm. t songs at my fingertips, but you forget. Yeah. Because with MP3s, you can't, you can't see them. Right. And I, I did that on the way here this morning. I was just happened to be flipping through and I, this wide mouth Mason song. Yeah. That I'd completely forgotten about. I was like, oh yeah. But see with the CD, I would have seen it. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. I used to like, yeah, they're a good band. Yeah. Love, love Wide Matt Mason. Yeah. Cool. Uh, last tune. I know nothing about this band. It's a bit of a premium obscure pick. Yeah. Wood Hands. <laughs> I wasn't made for fighting. So Wood Hands. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know if they're, they're not even still around anymore. I think Paul, their drummer, was in Royal Alberta Advantage as well. So uh, Dan, the lead singer, two 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 piece band. How I got into them though is they played Steam Whistle Unsigned. Mm. Our, our concert series here at Steam Whistle. So they played oh. one of the first ones. Wow. Uh, Matt Weed, who has gone on to other things outside of Steam Whistle more recently, um, was really the kind of the vision behind Steam Whistle Unsigned and kind of the curator of that mm -hmm. uh, for many years. I think they played at the first or second uh, Steam Whistle Unsigned. So they were sort of like right on the, w when things went from big digital back to analog, mm -hmm. they're kind of electro pop a little bit, synth pop a little bit. Um, but the amount of sound that came out of the two of them and I wasn't made for fighting is just a great party song. Yeah. That's why I chose it because it really, for me, links that that time frame where sort of I've been here 17 years now. So this is wow. going back to 2007, 2008, something like that. Mm -hmm. And when we'd be partying as a, as a group, which we did a, a lot of in those days, still do to a lesser degree, obviously, during COVID. But mm -hmm. um, be out on a on a Friday night or be at a party it would always come on. And it's just such a. You know, it, it evokes that time in the company, that time uh, here. And, and also, like, we, we remained, in, you know, we had a connection with that band for for an extended period of time. They played a couple of shows that we sponsored at places like the Phoenix here in Toronto. Oh, wow. So, um, 
yeah, it's probably a pretty obscure pick, but certainly a song that, that sort of takes you back to a place in time, at least for me. That's yeah. great. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, was thinking about that indie concert series. So what was it? It was unsigned bands that you would feature once a week. Yeah, no, they weren't always like officially unsigned, but they would be sort of uh, at least independent labels. And, and the whole idea was uh, it being sort of a curated uh, series. We, at the time, did it quarterly. We did it for about five or six years. Um, oh. And... Uh, and the whole idea was to sort of shine the spotlight on sort of up and coming new interesting music, Canadian, mm-hmm. obviously, uh, almost exclusively. So we had a number of uh, bands that were, you know, Richard Coyne played it. We had, uh, you know, bands like the Darcy's play it just as they were sort of coming up. So over over sort of the uh, I guess five or six years we were doing it, we had some really successful shows. We had some shows that were less successful, admittedly, too. <laughs> so that was part of the reason, uh, you know we sort of reevaluated it and figured out how, how we can best support music on a go forward basis. But yeah, it was such a, such a fun way for us to sort of shine the spotlight on some up and coming music and, and also at the same time, create a, a great party it was part of the intention behind it too. Absolutely. Come down to the roundhouse, have a bunch of beers, see some interesting music and, uh, and have a great time was kind of the idea of it. So see again, the, the character of the brand. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, great list, Tim. Thank you so much. This has been great. Oh, it's been chat. great. It's been fun to chat with you, uh, Brent. I just I mean, we should have had a beer. That's the only thing I, I think I back to that I would have done differently. Is we should have <laughs> cracked a beer at the start of the podcast, but we'll do that next time. Yeah, we will. We will for sure. Right on. Thank you very much. This has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Tim McLaughlin. Till next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Subway, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.